from the protection of the environment and natural resources, as well as from the prevention and care of pollution and other environmental damage. Kung Hai. Okay, so here you can see <coughs> that it's an embodiment of all laws, and it's mainly environment protection law. Okay, right now I would show you three main principles, also called the trilogy of principles, in environmental law. These three principles are precautionary principle, Vorsorge Prinzip, Yuvangyuanzi, and with respect to this principle, we can also already find a legal definition, so a definition written into a law, and concretely it is written in Article 1 of the EPL, the Environmental Protection Law. So, <clears throat> what does this principle mean? It simply means that precaution is the first priority in environmental law, and precaution um, has to be has to be done first. And then with respect to the second principle, which is called the polluter pace principle or Verursacher Prinzip, in Chinese, Shei Wuran, Shei Zhili, the Yuan Zi, we can say that this is only the second principle because there exists also a hierarchy of these three principles. And this principle simply means that someone who causes pollution which is illegally is liable to this pollution. This is very reasonable, of course. But nevertheless, there exists the so-called principle of common burden, Gemeinlastprinzip, Gungtung Fudan Yuan Zi, which is the opposite principle. And right now you want to know, of course, when does this principle of common burden work? This principle generally works with mainly um, the, product the production of our daily waste we produce. So this kind of waste, which is of course, legally produced waste and legally produced pollution. This is um, carried by the general public. So every one of us has to pay um, yes, fees that manage or that are proposed to manage waste. So this falls under the principle of common burden. A third principle is the cooperation principle, Kooperationsprinzip, Roto Yönze or Gung Chung San Yu Yönze. So this principle, when you look at the second Chinese term here, um, it actually comes clear what it means. It means that the uh, public participates uh, with respect to certain issues in environmental law enforcement. So just to give you an example, sometimes in cases of so-called in-plant environmental management, betriebliches Umweltmanagement, or also called environmental auditing, we can find plans that decide on a voluntary basis to allow assessors who are licensed by the state to control the environmental quality of the respective plant. So this is a clear example of what is called in-plant environmental management. I cannot go more into detail here, but if you want to, if you want to know more about this, I um, recommend you this book. It's edited by Robert Häuser and Jan Graf. Robert Häuser is the mostly is the main leading um, legal scholar with respect to Chinese law in Germany, and he has edited together with Jan de Graaf in 2001 this book called Umweltschutzrecht der VR China, so environmental protection law, and this is, as far as I know, the only book that deals in a very very broad scope with environmental law in today's China. Okay, so. Let's get to the next slide. So I just told you that environmental law is the law that protects the environment. So we can say that, envi that the environment is the general subject of protection. And uh, with respect to environmental law, we can nevertheless say that there are some particular subjects of protection. And here we can once more find a legal definition legal definition in Chinese fa ding ding yi. In Article 2 of the EPL, Environmental Protection Law, which reads, environment as used in this law refers to the total body of all natural elements and artificially transformed natural elements affecting human existence and development. 
which includes the atmosphere, water, seas, land, minerals, forests, grasslands, wildlife, natural and human remains, Renwenichi uh, nature reserves, historic sites and scenic spots, Fengqing Mingshengqi, and urban and rural areas. So I've um, put some terms here in bold types, and I just want to um, explain these. Explain why. Okay, the first terms are affecting human existence and development. So here we have what is called in environmental law an anthropocentric approach, which is the opposite of the so-called ecocentric approach. So the man mankind actually mankind actually is in the center of this understanding and not the ecosystem as a whole. So this is the first important um, thing I want to tell you. And by the way, we also have this in the German Grundgesetz, the German Basic Law, when we read about the Sicherstellung der natürlichen Lebensgrundlagen, so the protection of natural basis of life. So here we can see a common tradition of Chinese law and German law. And the second thing, which was very striking for me when I first already two years or three years ago read this law in Dr. Leibold's course was uh, where the terms of human remains, historic sites and scenic spots. So why was this very striking for me? Because here we see that uh, products or that things produced by man, so something like, for instance, cultural um, things like the Dunhuang Shiku, the Dunhuang Caves, also fall under the term of environmental protection. So this is very, at least for me, very, or was very striking for me. Okay, so this slide I will leave out and switch to the historical part. <coughs> so let's have a look at environmental law in the PRC until 1979. Uh, this era is also called the Mao era since it was the reign of Mao Zedong. And here uh, you can see a citation from the book of, or no, it's the title of the book of Julian Shapiro. And this title, Mao's War Against Nature, actually shows us how environmental law could have worked. Actually, there was no law during the Mao, during the Cultural Revolution, um, which was uh, mainly produced by Mao Zedong. And the state, the state at, in this era um, was seen as a powerful driving force behind environmental degradation, as Shapiro writes in his book, in her book. And then in 1972, we see the first big environmental catastrophe, so a food poisoning case caused by fishes, a human food poisoning case caused by fishes off Lake Guanting. And in the same year, we see the participation of the PRC in the Stockholm Conference, which was the first big uh, United Nations conference. So the conference, the UN Conference on the Human Environment. So both factors, so the inner factor and the outside factor, worked as something like a starting point, as Eva Sternfeld, um, a Sino scholar from Berlin, writes in one of her papers <coughs> for the Chinese environmental movement. And then in 1973, uh, the first national environmental conference of the PRC took place. In uh,